Daniel Negreanu once described Stefan Sontheimer as the greatest No Limit Hold'em tournament player in the world, and with good reason. Sontheimer has earned over 30 million playing like tournaments in the highest stakes games in the world, including in 2017 when he became the Poker Master in Las Vegas, and in 2018 when he won 3.7 million in a 250,000 pound buying event in the Bahamas. In this episode of I Am High Stakes Poker, Sontheimer talks about his trouble-free childhood, why you should not bottle up your emotions in life and at the poker table, and how he has no interest whatsoever in living up to Negreanu's billing as being the world's greatest player. Hey Stefan, how's it going? All right, all right, just uh, coming back from the spa, relaxed, having a good, a good time. You like the spa, because you, 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 do you go in there daily when you're here? Uh, I try to. Um, I mean, the tournament started either 12 or 3, um, so I have breakfast in the morning. I'm on, a, on an okay s uh, sleeping schedule for a, for a poker player, I would say, like getting up at 9, 9.30ish. And uh, yeah, it just relaxes me. It's fine. It's cool. Are you, are you good at managing time when you've got nothing to do, or are you the type of person that always has to go looking for something, picking up your phone, reading or something? I think like with time in general, I'm, I'm on the better side when it comes to poker players, like planning things ahead and, and booking stuff especially. Um, but in like my everyday life, I try to be as spontaneously as possible because I mean, I'm just writing so often with so many people when I'm in Vienna. I mean, we have that big crew there and I'm always up to any kinds of sports, for example. So um, yeah, that's, that's great. When someone messages like, what about basketball in one hour? I'm usually like one of the first in, let's go. Right, so you're not one of those that uh, goes to bed the night before and you've got your Google calendar out and you're planning everything in that you're gonna do for the next day. You just, it's, it's blank space. Blank space, yeah. Like I have something in my mind, like I love to get some stuff done before, I usually skip breakfast in my everyday life. Um, and then I want to get stuff done before I have like lunch or my first meal of the day, whether it's like, doing a little coaching or doing like a 90 minute session cash game or review hands from the day before that, that feels great. Like gives you another feeling than really starting the day. And then, well, I try to take the afternoon off and then work by night again because afternoon just has the, the biggest value for me personally to take time off. Was there a time before poker where life had to be more structured for you? I mean, we can go back like to school times where it is like, okay, I always did lots of sports. I had my, my like, I mean, I had school and I had like Monday table tennis, Tuesday football, Thursday football, Friday table tennis. Like a couple of years I added a third sports as well. And it's like lots of stuff. So you have those plans and weekend always some kind of sports too. So yeah, there were different times. And then there was a time in my life, I would say university where I just had try to do as much as possible. So there it was university, it was poker plus sports and everything needs some time if you want to succeed somehow. Uh, so yeah, I skipped lots of partying for that, I guess. But uh, yeah, it was a good time to just a little, little, little tough um, having that, that big of a schedule. What was childhood like for you when, when you were growing up? Um, it's like, I'm looking for the English word. It's like what you, what you would call like a great, having a great childhood. I mean, I, I grew up opposite side of a farm pretty much. Uh, like, I mean, I was going there, getting the milk directly from like the, the farmer people there. I, I had my, I mean, it was a small village. I had my sports clubs. I had my good friends around. Um, it was like within the natures in the black forest in Germany, like beautiful, beautiful landscape. And um, yeah, that was great. I know you're not a parent yet, um, but you know I am. You see my little daughter every morning in, in breakfast. And one of the things I always worry about is like when she goes to school, is she going to be okay? Like, yeah. you know, is she going to get bullied? Is she going to have a hard time? That kind of thing. What, what, was, your, what was your school like? Was, was, there, was there bullying like that? Did, which side of the divide it's did you end up on? Not, not really. I mean, um, it's like, it's really small. So it's, you have your crew still from kindergarten and like those people is like half of your class then in the, like when in first grade. And so you have your buddies and there are some new people as well that come like from one village further or like from the different kindergarten. But that's, that's, I mean, very small, everyone having a good time. I, I can, I 
would guess that it's very different in like larger cities mm. where you you get thrown in there, you don't know anyone, you have like people from all kinds of backgrounds, and uh, yeah, that was that was not for me. We were talking before and weren't we about 1999 and the, the Champions League final between Bayern Munich and United and you were saying you were eight. Uh, when you were younger, did sport like dominate everything? What, what else was you interested in as a child? Um, good question. I try to remember. So yeah, sports was a big deal. Um, I did uh, was it track and field or mm. athletics, whatever yeah, you athletics. call it. I did that forever. Then I started playing table tennis. Uh, I always had like was on off soccer f like I started playing then I didn't for a while because like my like my main friends didn't play that and it was like then it was kind of boring because you always want to hang out with your best friends and uh, oh we were talking about those big sports events I, I remember so much stuff like what was it um, Olympics 1996 I remember we spent the whole summer on like a little island in the North Sea I was watching sailing because it was Olympic Games, you know, like right. stuff like that that is really boring if you're not into it, yeah, especially yeah. watching it. I remember like preparing, a, like my dad was like building a like a huge flag by ourselves, like with paper and gold and red and black for the Euro finals 1996. This is like my first memory that I still have. I in, don't remember in, the in, match uh, or in 1996. In England, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I guess so. Yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, it was in England. And uh, yeah, then I just told you before UEFA Champions League final, uh, and then it started like 2000. I don't remember that Euros too well, but 2002, I know every single match where I have been or watching it. I remember Euro, uh, not Euros, Olympics 2000 in Sydney. Pretty much, I, I still know like German names that won the medals there. Pretty much, and I was nine. Like it's, it's a big, it was a big deal always. Mm. It sounds it, yeah. And we were talking like before camera, weren't we, about the Champions League semi-finals this year with Spurs and their late their late goal and Liverpool and, and I told you that, you know, I brought a tear to my eye even though I didn't have an affiliation with the team and you were saying that same thing happens to you. And and for men, you know, some sometimes in some areas like crying is not deemed to be a manly thing to do. Um, how did you grow up to be so okay with showing your emotions? That's why I'm not crying too often, but it affects me definitely, like especially those sports events, because it's like I was never doing anything on like a high level, but it still feels playing a lower league of soccer or having like a, I mean, the first trophy I won doing some kind of sports. That's like, it's like that feeling that is in, in you and you, it reminds you of that a little and you just see how much bigger it is. And actually, I mean, when I was younger, I was always looking up to those guys and now I see those and I'm actually older and more experienced and these are like 20 year old kids that have the biggest success that is possible in like the biggest sports in the world I would say it's uh it's pretty insane to watch yeah can you can you remember a time when you had a goosebump moment in poker watching someone else and also a time when you yourself was very emotional because of something that happened to you a goosebump watching poker that's a that's a tougher one I would say um I don't remember, I watched some of like Poker After Dark and that stuff, but that never affected me too much. Um, I think that maybe the first moments I, um, I pretty much railed my friends playing live. I wasn't playing live back then. Yeah. I remember being on ski vacation with uh, Julian Thomas and some others and we had our break, like have a beer and, and eat a schnitzel pretty much. And that was the first big tournament that, uh, I think it was the first Triton one that Fedor won. Right. And it was day two or day three, final day of it. No, it was the first day two, we looked it up and it was like, okay, 15 players left, three didn't show up because they felt like they have too short of a stack. And we're like, what's, what's going on there? And then day three, not seeing it, but just reading the news, like, okay, it's three left, Fedor chip leading, etc. And it's like, Oh, this is really sick. This is like one of my close friends by that time. And it was it's a lot like, of money back then as it's well. It's a lot of money. Mm. I mean, I didn't talk to, to him about how much he invested himself, but it's, that was like maybe one. And then, well, the, the big moments that come to mind are obviously Super High Roller Bowl 2016 with Reiner and Fedor, and then uh, One Drop 2016 with Fedor and Korai getting first and third. That was, I was standing on the rail and that was a that was good feeling. And what about yourself? Have you had a goosebump moment yourself? I mean, we, I, I always remember being in 
Bratislava when Roberto Romanello won WPT Bratislava. I was literally right next to him writing and, and he just burst out. He just fell apart. He, like he couldn't talk. Have you ever had any moments? Mm. Not necessarily crying, but like an emotionally charged one. Yeah, actually not really. Um, I mean, you got to know that I, I never won like one of the like bigger field events or did even have a deep run, like mm. not an EPT main. This is where I would get it. Like now, Manny Glöser just winning EPT Monte Carlo mm. was like, I was so happy for him not being financially invested because this would be something, like thinking about it, I get yeah, it a I'm little just here. Doing you it. can no, see I'm get, it. I'm getting it as well. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah, like it, I, I know like it's he's playing that forever. It means so much to him winning such a prestigious event. Mm. I haven't been in that spot. Like, okay, I, I won big events for, for like big high rollers, for big money, but these were always those 30, 40 runner fields. Uh, where it's like, okay, every now and then you should win one of those. Obviously, Poker Masters felt, felt great, but it was like not, not, not really one of those goosebump moments. Is there, is there anything about your childhood that, like a, an event that happened or the way that you was raised that, de that defined your personality today? So for example, when I was a kid, I was half Chinese, so I'd never, I never fitted in. I was in an all white school. And so I turned into this like little angry little man, like <laughs> who, who needed to like prove himself all the time. Is it, have you ever thought about that before? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was definitely easier for me than for you and that because I was just like one of many of same kind pretty mm. much. Um, I had like one moment that, or not, not a moment, but like what was all the way through my childhood was that I was always the youngest pretty much. In your in your in your year, yeah. Like mm. I got in I got in school, and somehow I could I could read and calculate already. Uh, I guess my parents did a pretty good job on that. Uh, so I skipped one class, and got up to the like one year older ones. And this is like where my friends were around. I have an older brother, and I was actually all like the best friends of my older brother were my sports mates. Like especially table tennis was like a crew I had. So mm -hmm. my class was always one year older and my best friends were mainly two years older. So right. this is what is like, I, I think, yeah, I, I don't, I'm looking for the English word for it, but it's like something that, that defines you as a person a little. I don't know in which way really, but it's just. Did it, are you saying it helped you grow up quicker because you was around more experienced people? Or was it more challenging because you were younger and they looked down on you? Yeah, I don't know even, like I, I wouldn't agree with, with either one, hmm. but like kind of a mix. Like sometimes it's that, I mean, I had, Maybe not, not trouble, but like some trouble in those ages where, uh, well, the boys get to men, you know, and uh, I was like two years late and I was like not, a, not developing very quickly. And they started like drinking hard alcohol. I remember some bad nights there, you mm -hmm. know. I remember one 16th birthday of like my friends and they're like, I got in late. I was, I don't know, 14 and a half or something. Like, hey, uh, Stefan, you got to catch up with that vodka orange juice here. Um, like okay, you know, you cannot, like in that age, you want to be part of it. You yeah. cannot really say no, or you're not strong enough, like to say like, no, that's not for me. I can't take it, you know? And I was like, okay. Um, yeah, that, that night didn't end too well. And I think I had a couple of those, you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, maybe this a little, but it's like, and then like, if you get over that point, then it's like, you're part of like, was never, I mean, that's maybe defines me a little, to have it easy to get in touch with other people of all kinds because mm. it's not like oh this is my crew and i got nothing to do with the older guys or like from them and like it's whatever i, I always mix with older people and i found it gave me more of a confidence like uh, socially because i was talking to older people so i felt older you know so yeah i think actually like in in school it helped me mm. that okay it was he's hanging out with those guys i know all the teachers already like my buddies had them already like same thing and okay i have that older brother so it's that helps in that case okay i know that name um yeah my brother is like one of those that like has a very very good reputation for every teacher like i'm a little different i'm i'm annoying to them as well like he wasn't so that was a positive side they are didn't treat me as like a random mm. kind of which is like helps usually but yeah um, it sounds like yeah you you mentioned like the vodka orange night you know like can't drink vodka until this day like no it's way it's so funny that my mine was Bacardi. like my first one was Bacardi. And everyone I, has one of yeah, those yeah, yeah it's always the short it's always like the top shelf stuff but you you mentioned about 
you know, we have to do it because we want to fit in. We want to, we want to, we want to be part of the tribe. We don't want to be kind of isolated, uh, and that's very true as when we're children. But it's also it also enters our lives sometimes as adults. And I, and I look at the poker uh, industry, particularly the high stakes poker, and these little groups of mm. people. Um, have you ever felt like and suffered from imposter syndrome? Like I don't think I belong here. And and how as the need to fit in, how has that existed in your life as you've gotten older and got into poker? Um, yeah, that's a good question. That's a, a pretty big deal, actually, because, um, I mean, I love where I'm from. I still have very good friends there, which I would say is different for lots of, lots of the high stakes players. But they just, they live, I mean, especially those guys living in Vegas, they live their life there in that way. Mm. Right? For me, it's pretty much two different lives if not even three, like the online grind is different again. Right? And then when I visit my parents' place, like hanging out, it's, it's like traveling back in time 10 years, you know? They're and still everything the is the same. Like, and that's, this actually, like one of the compliments I get that means by far the most to me is like from those old friends that tell me, Stefan, like it's, it's sick what you're doing, but you're, you're still the same we got to know like 15 years ago. Yeah. And this, is, this means a lot to me and I'm, like I tell like all my friends or uh, yeah everyone pretty much that this is what we are doing here is crazy. Like from my perspective, it's it's just crazy, right. and it's definitely not my world. It's not my world going out eating like three star restaurants every day, like being in a place like here, which is like for rich people, mm -hmm. and I I don't consider myself being part of it. Right? I enjoy it when I'm here because my job kind of gives it to me, mm -hmm. but it's it's just it's not my world. You don't, you don't see yourself like in, in terms of class structures. It sounds like in your heart, you're more working class with your dad building flags out of paper mache. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm not thinking in those terms too much, but it's just like uh, what means something to me, right? For me, it's not important, like spending a lot of money to like be in a place like that. That is, I don't know, I go down there uh, talk to the local waiters, have a good time and, and have a proper meal there instead of being here and eating something fancy. Hmm. You know, and then, yeah, I don't know. I enjoy being home as well. I mean, now, now my new home is Vienna and uh, that, that feels great too, like hanging out there. It was, uh, that was great getting in touch with like normal people from there as well. Like uh, I consider myself normal too, so that shouldn't be like from a look down and this is something different. And that's just, yeah, it's great. Have you ever had any time in, in your life or in poker, or just in your life, I guess, where you've been lonely? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I was grinding Supernova Elite for two years um, and I moved to Brighton after finishing university. And um, yeah, I moved there with uh, Ben CB, that people know from online and uh, Reiner Kempi. And well, it was the three of us and there was a, was a small German community, but we tried, we tried to somehow connect to like the people there, the normal people in Brighton. I joined a table tennis team that was cool once a week, but it wasn't like there were, were no friendships or anything happening. I was just hanging out with the German community and it felt like even if we were trying, there was no chance. I guess the main plan was going there. We just join a football club and then everything will go by itself. Well, yeah. they, we, we go for a low league. The three of us are pretty much the same level when it comes to football. So we might be even help for the team and then they like us pretty much and we can hang out with them. And then we got there and it was Ben and myself being injured at the same time. So I had a knee surgery and I was done for a, like no sports for a year yeah. pretty much. And then I was like, we actually thought about it, had those moments. We were kind of lonely together, like right. still not alone <laughs> alone, but, um, and it was like, how, where did we find friends before? Okay, friends from school back then. Friends from university, we don't have that there. Friends from sports, oh, we can't do it. It's like, do you really meet friends going out a Saturday night? Not really. Do you meet friends in a bar? Not really, right? That comes from somewhere else. Like you meet friends through other friends, but it's like, yeah, I mean, it was, it was cool hanging out with the German community there, but it was just too small. Like it was tough to sometimes arrange like, let's go play beach volleyball. Mm. Not even talking about not like the weather there not being perfect for beach volleyball. Uh, <laughs> no. like, I mean, it's, it's good for the UK in Brighton, but yeah, to the rest of the world, Yeah, it was not. too windy. Like, I mean, whether sometimes there is some sun, I don't want to give too much shit to them, <laughs> but um, yeah. It's like, and it was just not really possible to get um, 10 to 12 people for like an indoor soccer match for 
on a regular basis. Mm. So that was like, that was the thing I was really missing. So I told myself pretty much what was my solution to it. I really see that as work. I get my stuff done there. I grinded like 12 to 16 hour days. Um, and then really told myself when I took break from that to enjoy every single minute I have in a place where I like it. Right. So that was, yeah. It, it seems like when you said that you and Ben CB were there and you were both lonely together, you know, it reminds me of we can be lonely in a mass of people. Yeah. And it sounds like um, that connection is really important to you. Yeah, like I, I, I like having like my kind of everyday life. You know? um, it's just so different when you have like, okay, Tuesday, Thursday, you see those people. Or even if it's like on a unregular but frequent, frequently, frequently based, like, okay, I know this week we'll go play basketball, someone will write. And this is what I have in Vienna, and this is great. Mm. Like our group chat with pretty much 100 people out there that have kind of the same interests and kind of the same schedule. Well, now it's obviously different when, I, when I'm at my parents' place. Okay, I can still join like the, the soccer team. And, um, but it's, it's like on the afternoon, well, the others work and I try to work a little by night or I'm on vacation. That's different, right? It's, it's like, so it's, it's great to have that crew around in Vienna. What are some of the challenges that you face in life? I mean, I would say actually just that, that we were talking about, like, it's uh, like not, yeah, caught between two worlds kind of, you know, mm. if you, you can either open up and be really part of that one world here. Like I remember a, a great talk I had with Nick Petrangelo. Like we were, uh, I was out uh, watching a hockey game with him in Vegas. We got so drunk, it was insane. And then we had like one of those men's talk that you can uh, only have when you're drunk. And uh, I was like, he was like, yeah, I love that. I love it so much, like traveling, playing that game, studying that game. And uh, I want to do that pretty much for the rest of my life. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Nah, not for, not for me. I loved it. I loved it 2013, 2014, 2015. I loved it. And then like all of a sudden it was like the fire was a little, it's still like, it actually like the last month it got a little back after taking some more breaks and choosing wisely where I want to go. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, that's kind of a kind of a problem right now, like being in that one world and to be on the top there or like to compete with the best. I mean, you have to invest so much and then you either give up on the other world, like what I like the most or you do it the other way around. And this is a little, this is a, a tough one. Uh, definitely a challenge. Yeah. When you are at events like this, is there then a part of you that is waiting, waiting for it to end so you can get back to Vienna? Whereas in the past, it would be like, I just got to be here. I'm 100% focused on this. Or are you capable of knowing in your heart that this is not your long-term home, but you can be focused for this? Is, is that, that, how would you feel when you're here in an event? Um, yeah, I, I would put it into two different things because you were saying an event like this here, I could stay way longer because okay. I enjoy it a lot. Right. And like, I have a good time even, I mean, I played four tournaments, a total of six bullets, I guess. I cashed the smallest one, but I think I played good and I would like to keep that going. Atmosphere is great, fields are great. And it's just like, okay, let's go another week. That would be great. Okay. Um, but what, pops in my mind the moment you quest, uh, you asked the question was definitely Vegas. Like, like the World Series grind? World Series. I did it once to stay there for six weeks and I told myself never ever again. Mm. Like, um, yeah, it's like you want to get out of that. I, I remember how I like had to cancel flights and booked earlier ones just to get out of that. Like it was instead of waiting for one day, I'd rather spend an amount of money that I never would never spend on flying, but just it meant so much for me that moment, like I leave here now. And uh, yeah, this is like, I have that definitely. I looked for your Twitter account just before we um, had this interview and you, you don't use it a lot, but there was one tweet that you wrote and it, it made me sad. And you just wrote, I think you wrote something like poker makes me sad. Or it was something like that, or, you know, it was, what, it, what is it about the game that, that draws Nick Petrangelo in, but makes you in a way look at it and go, I need to get out of this at some point? Um, 
I'm just trying to remember from when, when that tweet was. Maybe it, it was a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago. Mm. Oh, I had I only have that Twitter account for two years. So oh, right, right. cannot really be true. But uh, I remember like I like to be honest about it always. Like we have those people that are like you know it's just a tournament. You got to be rational. It's like the next one is coming and it's lots of variants. And this is just like I mean either you are that way, which is good on the one hand, but bad on the other, because I experienced that myself, that you put that into other parts of your life, that you get like a little emotionally cold, I would say. Um, and I don't want to have that too much. Like, it's fine. Like, if I play a cash game and lose a pot, I'm definitely fine. Mm. Like, I remember last year, um, WSOP, I played for two weeks straight and didn't have a single cash. I pretty much bubbled the main event. I pretty much, oh, well, I bubbled a 25k aria. I had a big flip for a big stack in the million one drop and didn't get anything going in the other events. Like this is just, it was a stretch of 10 tournaments, which is nothing. Right? Yeah. But still it was like, okay, I flew there. I was just like non-successful, uh, lost lots of money. And for me, it's fine to let the world know that this is kind of makes me sad and I'm pissed right now. And I don't want to see those cards for three weeks straight. Yeah. Right? So this is, I guess that's okay to tell, to tell the people, you know, um, it's just like that. It's, it's okay. Like the, I invest that much that I'm fine with it. It's not about the money, but the emotions are there. Mm. Right? So the, like, it's, it's fine after the first week. And uh, it's like just the risk of then playing again and losing again, because then it comes back. Uh, so I took like three weeks off and uh, I, yeah, I, I tried to do that every now and then and that feels great. And then you're thrilled about it again. And I came here, I didn't play a live event since PCA mm. and I was like, let's go. It's a great event. Mm. It's a great place. I was lucky uh, or happy to see so many faces, uh, like friendly faces. Everyone is having a good time. And uh, yeah. It seems like you need to take the Fedor approach of um, just playing or Linus, when I interviewed Linus, uh, I only interviewed him for three minutes, but here's this 24 year old and he's like, yeah, I am just going to play when I want to play, not when I need to play. Yeah. Uh, and that sounds like this, that, that would work for you maybe. Yeah. I mean, um, that's like kind of does for the emotions, but then you have the trouble that it's tough to stay on top. Because you need to invest so much time to be in yeah, this. Yeah, so Linus, because of where you're playing Linus had fields. that thrill in himself that he told himself, let's say 2013 or 15, I don't even know, like, I want to be the best of the world. Mm. And that kept him going. I, I don't know him too well. That's just like my, what I've seen or heard from him yeah. uh, or like from people that surround him a little. Uh, and that's like, that's what he did. He was there on his computer pretty much 24 seven whenever he was not sleeping. Mm. This is what I think, like, yeah. I, I don't know, but uh, I've seen him in the lobbies. I've seen him, not, not seen him, but heard him studying solvers and everything. And now he is there and well, he has the financial freedom, I guess now uh, to do whatever he wants. And now, yeah, I mean, I'm cherry picking a little, like I'm looking forward so much to that summer because it will only be two weeks of WSOP for me. Uh, we talked it through yesterday with lots of the players, like no super high roller bowl. That means for lots of those players, there's no like, no, I mean, it sounds stupid. It's like, it's, no need it's, to hang around. It's, it's great to have that event going and mm. to play there, but still you feel like you would miss out on something. This is why you have to go there. So, and this feeling is away now because it's in December. And so I can just go there in July for the main event, the 10 K six max and the hundred K and maybe some aria stuff. And this is like, but I will be looking forward to, I, I will be th in mid of June. I will be thrilled about going to Vegas now reading from some of my friends will win something. And some of people, uh, some of the people I am not friends with will win something. And then I'm like, I gotta be there, you know, like this yeah, thrill yeah, comes yeah. back and, uh, but only two weeks and then it's good again, back to vacation, summer in Europe. When you mentioned the main event, then I, I had, <laughs> got the chills again. I mean, I've never played in it, but I, I imagine when we talk about emotional moments in poker, you can't get more emotional than having a deep run in a World Series of Poker main event. I know it's a 10K for you, which is like a 1K, but that is like... No, I, I don't know, like, because I never had a deep run. <laughs> I'm like, I, I played three main events so far. I have a day two, a day three, and another day three. No cash yet. So uh, I'm working on that, but I just see people and how much it means to them. Mm. I mean, I have been on that November 9 final table on the rail for Kenny Hallard. And that was get it again yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like i have that picture in my mind it's yeah, insane what yeah. happened there now we have no november nines mere, uh, niner anymore but mm. it's still like that and fedor got 25th i guess mm. one year 
like seeing Nigriano getting 10th or 11th, doubling the, the final tail, yeah. I was like, these are the moments mm. you're, you're looking for. And I, I was like, when I kind of bubbled, like 100 off the money with 1100 paid last year, kings versus knights, I bust, you know, I'm fine with it. But then like, it's not just the, 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 like the, the value that that pot had, which was like, I don't know, like 60K at that point, that definitely bothers me. Um, and uh, yeah, it's more the, like the dream that is over. You're Although, missing a memory. You're losing a memory. You know you're missing a memory. It's like you ha would have a stack in the money in the softest tournament in the world, mm. in the biggest tournament in the world. And that was, it was not only some value, it was a shot at like having a great time and great memories. I mean, why not making that Fedor run getting 25th? Yeah. Obviously, I would be pissed again busting 25th, yeah. but it's still the, the experience stays, yeah. right? And it will, two years later, you're saying like, that, that was pretty cool. Like I, I look at all those videos, like this day five, people go in there. So, hey, we're back, like everyone happy, smiling faces, day six. Day seven, like I watch. I, I walked in there. A friend of mine, uh, Mario Mosbach. I don't know whether you know him. I don't know. He had like a deep run at forty fifth or something, and he asked me for his table, and he was like, "Could we just?" I was staying in the Rio. Could you just show up? You know, like show those players that you are a buddy of mine, yeah, like yeah. to kind of give them get a bit them. of fear and intimidate. Like right? Yeah. I mean, th there's a thing about it in the main yeah. event. Oh, he must be good, so I'd rather play not as many hands hmm. uh, against him. Like I, I got because telling that I'm buddy of Fedor, I got a walk once from King 10 off. Like he was in the small line and showed King 10 off. Oh, you're buddies with those high stakes sickos. <laughs> Fold. This works yeah. like that. And that feeling coming into that room and it was like seven or eight tables left. I'm like, oh, this is an actual tournament. And mm. everyone in there has the feeling of I might win it. Mm. You know, it's like the up, up there, we, we are sitting in a room and you can see, okay, it's those few tables. One of us will win it. Yeah. You have that every single time you register for it. But in the main event, mm. different days, different rooms, everything crowded. Wow. It's crazy. It's crazy. So you talked about Linus wanting to be the best in the world at one point. So that's not something that interests you anymore? No. It's like, I know how it would work like the, i know the path to be there mm. and that's just putting lots of work in there and it's a kind of work that i don't enjoy so um, i enjoyed it much more before the solver generation where we had our use i mean we still have to use our brain like does i don't want to sound stupid but before it was like getting those ideas and so i i, I remember like going to uni sitting there like you right now in the train with a pen and a paper, and I've, I've had that on my Twitter account, like making random yeah, formulas so I, to, yeah. to figure out stuff. Um, I found one of those like last year, and um, this was like what gave me the, the thrill. Like, oh, this is cool. Like, how do blockers work in those spots? How does like how does that? What does that mean? What is optimal bet sizing? How do I find that out? And now it's more like before it was like studying math, and now it's like studying economics like yeah. i did kind of both so it's i i feel competent enough to to talk about it uh, i i know our economics teachers like take this 1000 pages script learn it by heart until next week and then we'll have an exam right? and th this is how poker is these days you look at every spot you learn it kind of by heart and then you have to put it bring it on the table right? so uh and i'm more the kind of guy I remember that was like in chapter five, one of the first three pages, there was this small box in the bottom right and he's exactly asking for that stuff, but I don't remember, you know? Mm. It's like, so I, I'd rather have the way of like, how do I figure out what should I do? Like the way of thinking it while playing. Rather than reading it. Reading you're, you're, and you're then retaining it by actually You can be a really, out. really good poker player these days without understanding the game. Right. Like, I mean, exaggerating a little but mm. uh, expand on that a little bit yeah it's like i mean like let's say you tournaments is a little different there's lots of different spots but let's say you play 100 bb cash game only soon 500 whatever um and you only have the same spots you can simplify stuff it's same spot again 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 let's say okay 100 big blinds we play we defend big blind versus hijack we have our preset preflop range um and we have that board so we study all ace high boards king high boards queen high boards and have like a little some rules of thumb 
And uh, then it's like, OK, I know I need to check raise this, this, and this. Like, let's say three, four different parts to make it easier. And you know that. And you have no clue why. Right. I'd, I'd rather know, like, what do I need? What is my check raising range? Like, OK, I need some bluffs that I want to triple barrel through with blockers to those sets. I need that backdoor equity to have whatever, when those cards come, to have, like, some nut potential. Like, this is more like how I would like to, 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 to think or how I'm thinking. And the, but the other way is working to be a great player these days. For online? For, For life, life as well. I mean, it's the same game. Hmm. Life is just one more thing. You can look at the other, and mainly the others can look at you. But if you're just hiding and just, you can put that, that part away in live poker. This, we had that big discussion lately. Like, should you be allowed to cover up this or that much sunglasses, whatever? Hmm. If Linus is sitting there, like that? I mean, he doesn't need to. He's like so chilled. Yeah, I was yeah. surprised how, how, how well he does there. Mm. Uh, but if you don't feel confident enough, you, you can do it. And then it's the same like online. Mm. So if someone is watching this and they harbor ambitions to become a high stakes reg, what, what are some of the advice and tips you would give them to get to the top? What has made you so successful? They are, um, Two, two main advices. Uh, yeah, I'm, you see, I'm prepared for that question uh, <laughs> because it's always coming up. Uh, and I like my answer because it's just two key factors. First, never do it just to have success or like do it for financial reasons. If someone sees like, okay, I'm good at math or whatever, like I'm good with logic and you can make lots of money playing poker, don't even try to start it. Just don't even try it. You need to love it. You need to have that fire that we were talking about. You need right. to have that thrill because it's just lots of work and there's no chance of being at the top. I mean, it's like the sports, kind of. Look at the best tennis players. Is there anyone who doesn't like the game and mm. is just doing it because you're kind of sporty and you think you can make a lot of money there? Yeah. It's not working like that. This is the first and if you have that, feel free. Feel free. And then the, it's the second key advice, surround yourself with the right people. That's just, I mean, that's kind of the Fedor history, Fedor story where I was part of, so it's kind of my same story, meeting the right people from the right, playing this kind of same games, specialists of all kinds, and you can take that actually as advice for anything you want to do in life. If you want to succeed in, this, in it, don't try alone. Right? You're just a far, un, like a big underdog against anyone else who is trying the same thing but has the right people around them. So find the right people to surround yourselves with and find something you love. So I guess the last question I'm going to ask you, as you're not falling out of love with poker, but you're starting to think about a life outside, what, what is that thing, next thing for Stefan that you're going to fall in love with? I'm looking. I'm looking for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have time. That's the good thing. Uh, poker gives me the freedom that it's not like, okay, I need to find a job now to... to get like a monthly salary so uh, I can look left and right and see I know like kind of the things that I'm good at plus I know the things that I'm interested in so I'm always keeping an eye on like is there any option in like uh, we were talking a lot of sp about sports in the beginning yeah. is there something that is like you know uh, maybe puts those things together hmm. like thinking about stuff like that this is like my first thought but it's not there's there's no plan uh, um, in my mind yet, but uh, I think I have plenty of time to find one. You do have plenty of time and I'm sure you'll find it. Stefan, thanks for joining us on I Am High Stakes Poker. I've really enjoyed your company. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Stefan Suntimer and I'm High Stakes Poker.